I blew my nose in that one a few times. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not Shrek. Yeah, Isaiah is the person Isaiah says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. <laughs> analogy. So there's going to be a day when I walk, when I walk to the judgment seat from heaven, carrying my bucket of righteousness. And this song is, how, is a little bit about how that's going to go. <laughs> Walked in and we 
Thank you, Roger. Great job. I ask you to turn your scriptures to Genesis chapter 12. Our associate pastor, Mike uh, May, is not here this morning. Him and Judy are, are uh, down at Wilmont, uh, and Mike is preaching uh, down there this morning for a sister church that is in between pastors. So uh, we're going to pray for him next week. Jim Ball is going to be down there uh, again uh, preaching at Lighthouse. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. The one at, um, yeah. Chippewa Lake, yes. Um, I knew he was gone, just didn't know where he was at. <laughs> yeah. But let's, let's begin in a word of prayer. Father, we, uh, we do thank you for the privilege of being able to proclaim your word, your word that is truth, the word that changes our lives and changes even the deepest of sinner into faith in Jesus Christ. For anyone who would turn from their sins and turn and place their trust in Jesus will be saved. And so I, uh, I pray for Brother Mike today as he, as he is preaching, probably at this same time, and I pray, Lord, that you would give him just a clarity of the words that you have put on his heart. And the Lord, uh, allow your word to go forth. Uh, and we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, we begin a series on faith, by faith. And we're going to look at some Old Testament people uh, who some are familiar to you and some not so familiar to you. Over the summer, and we're going to see that faith played an integral part of them being in Scripture. And you know what? We have the need for faith every day. You use faith every day. And I'm not talking about biblical faith, but as a way of illustration, you do use faith every day. Every time you drive your car down the road, you're using faith. You're using your faith that in the last second of a car that's coming towards you at no more than six feet away from you when it crosses you, is not going to make a turn into your path and to take your life. You have faith in the food that you eat that is not contaminated, that when you open it from its package, it is fully ready to eat and you, and, uh, you are able to enjoy it without the fear of it being something that will harm you. You have faith in medicine that you take. Remember Mr. Gower from It's a Wonderful Life. If it wasn't for George Bailey, what would we watch at Christmas time? Mr. Gower, a druggist, tried to put wrong medicine in the wrong bottle. We don't have that fear because we trust that that is not going to happen when we open our bottle. You have faith every night with your spouse that they are not going to kill you in your sleep. <laughs> or as we told the 12 couples last week in the marriage enrichment, time that we had. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, is what the scripture says. That way they won't take your life in your sleep. <laughs> you practiced faith this morning when you came into the room. For you came in and came under a roof that you trust is going to not collapse on top of you. And you found a seat and you placed your backside on it, and put all your weight upon it, trusting that that seat was going to hold you. In studying for this, I came across a very excellent way of talking about this from John MacArthur, about the faith that we have. And he says this, there are only two ways to live. One way, by far the most common, 
is to live by sight, to base everything on what you see. This is the empirical way, the first hand, the practical, the realistic way. The other way, far less common, is to live by faith, to base your life primarily and ultimately on what you cannot see. The Christian way, of course, is the faith way. We have never seen God or Jesus Christ or heaven or hell or the Holy Spirit. We have never seen any of the people who wrote the Bible or any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. Though we see the results of them, we have never seen any of the virtues that God commands or any of the graces that he gives. Yet, we live in the conviction of all of these things by faith. We bank our earthly lives and our eternal destiny on things we have never seen. That is the way of the people of God in the way they have always lived. Excellent, Dr. MacArthur. Hebrews chapter one says that now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. <laughs> faith involves two things, one belief and two trust. A belief in what you are putting your faith in. But that alone is not salvation faith. There must be trust in what you are putting your faith in. So I remember a few months ago, maybe a few years ago now, that Mike Rydenball upstairs in the old sanctuary put a big ladder up on the stage. And do you remember? He climbed up the ladder and he got a blindfold out, and he said, in just a, one minute, I am going to fall backwards off this ladder, trusting that there are going to be people under me to catch me. I like the chair method better. <laughs> <laughs> Either Mike has more faith, or it was just a stupid thing to do, but you remember, <laughs> You remember that people were there to catch him, right? He put his faith completely in someone else. You see, I can believe that this chair will hold me. I can read the specs of how much weight it'll hold. But I do not have faith in this chair until I am willing to sit down in it. It is only when I sit down in it that I have faith. Because faith is, is, a, is a trust that is based upon an action. It is based upon following through with what your faith, what you are putting your faith in. It's a response. It's a reaction to what you believe in. And when we talk about biblical faith, it is important because of this, it is impossible to be a part of God's family without it. It is impossible, according to Hebrews chapter 11, to please God without faith. And it pleases God when we place our faith and trust in him, even though we have never seen him. Biblical faith is not something you can purchase. It's not something that you can sell to your friends, or even give away. It comes from God. It is not something that I believe, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that even comes from us. It is something that God grants to us, and then we give back to him in obedience. So here, as we begin this series in Genesis chapter 12, we see the father of all the faithful. It is Abraham. Abraham, who God calls to go from the place where he is at to a place that he is going to tell him where to go. And he makes some promises to him that seem so irrational and there's no possibility. But as Jim has said, all things are possible. So 
So let's look at these few verses, the first nine verses of chapter 12. And would you stand as we reverence the reading of God's holy word? And the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And he took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he, set, uh, he went on towards the hills of Bethel, and he pitched a tent in Bethel on the west side of Ai, on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. You may be seated. This morning I'd like for us to look at this passage in three different ways. The first one is faith to go when called by God. Faith to go when called by God. Now, who is this Abraham? We know a little bit about him from some genealogy before, a little bit about him from some ancestry before that are listed in scripture. But the careful thing that we need to understand is that Abraham would be like someone like us instead of like someone you would think he would be. You see, I would think, and maybe you would think, that God would come down and pick the most righteous man who is on the earth and call him to do what God is wanting him to do. But according to Joshua chapter 24, in verse 2, Abram, Abram, then called Abraham, and his father worshipped idols. He grew up in a pagan country because there were no people of God. He grew up in a place where the, excuse me, <coughs> where there were idols to be worshipped and his family worshipped idols. But when God came and when God spoke to him, it's amazing how things change because Abraham put his faith in what God had said. Hebrews account of this says it this way when speaking of Abraham. By faith Abraham when he was called to go to a place which he should after receive as an inheritance obeyed and went not knowing where he went. God tells him, Abram, I want you to go. Leave the country where you're at. Leave your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Now that is faith. He lived in a city. He lived in a country, the Bible tells us, Ur of the Chaldeans. He had his family, his possessions, his reputation, his business, his life was there. He was called to leave it all. And there was no nation of Israel. There was no promised land. There was no people of God as such. Yet God came and said to him, I am calling you. It says here, the Lord came to Abram and says, leave 
leave the land, your people, your father, your household, and go to the land, I will show you. He is being called by God, by name. This is not a general call to everybody in the land of Ur, and, and uh, Abram sticks his hand up and said, I'll go. No, this comes straight to Abram, and Abram hears the, the call of God, and the call in the, in the uh, Hebrew is, is a present participle means God is still calling. He is, God is working in his life as he is calling and preparing him. And I don't know how long it took Abram to get everything connected. I don't know how long it was for him to gather all the, his possessions that he was going to take and to gather his, his family with him that he was going to take. You know, we know he takes his wife. We know he takes his nephew. He takes his servants. And that may have taken days. It could have taken weeks. It could have taken months. But the indication from this is he went. He was beginning to go. It is though he is saying yes to God. I'm going to go wherever you call me to go. He left everything that was familiar to him. And he and his wife would start over. Where would they end up? Only God knew. Why should he go? Because God promised that he would be the one through all the world, the people would be blessed. Interesting is the second point in this. Faith believes God to do the impossible. Because in this account, he says to him, I will make you into a great nation. And he concludes it by saying, and all the peoples of the world will be blessed through you. Interesting to note, Abraham, later to be called Abraham, is 75 years old, past childbearing years. His wife is old. And God says, I am going to give you a nation. I'm going to make a nation out of you. He later tells him that they're going to be so fast that you can go out, Abram, and look up at the stars, and if you could count the stars, so many is going to be the offspring from you. And as many as the sands on the seashore are going to be the people who will come from you. Abraham, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Abraham says yes. And he collects his stuff and he begins his journey to a place he does not know to do what God has called him to do and he knows not how. You and I know that it would take, it would take another decade or two before Abraham would conceive the first son, Isaac. A long time to be able to hold on to a promise. Chuck Swindoll says, Abraham demonstrated faith by moving into an uncharted course with one guarantee that God was with him. Think about this. Christianity is not complicated. The neglect of your walk is complicated. The secret is to refine this walk through the filter of simplicity so that it comes back to the basics, which is faith. Abraham is really simple. Do you trust what you have heard from me, who is God? Five times in this little two verses, verse two and verse three, God says, I will. I will make you into a nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. It is God who is going to do it, Abraham. It is not you. Put your trust in him. And when you put your trust in him, you will see what only you can see when you put your trust into him. It is the same way now. You will only, put your, you will only see what you will see when you put your trust in what you put your trust in. You will only get a seat in this room if you put your seat on that chair.
Faith is not something you conjure up on your own. Nor is it something that you're born with, nor is it something that you work really hard and you study really hard and it comes to you. No, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it is a gift from God. Not because you deserve it, not because you earn it, not because you're worthy of it. It is not from ourselves, it is from God. It is not obtained by your power or by your will. It is attained by faith in what God is giving you, receiving the faith that God is giving you. Faith is simply given to us, faith is simply given to us by God, along with his grace, along with his mercy, along, along with his plan and his purpose. And for that, he gets all the glory. Faith is in a person, not in things. Biblical faith is in a person, the person of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when Abram here goes, he takes his family, he banks upon this promise, I'm going to leave everything that I've known, and I'm going to go because I am trusting this God who says he is going to make me into a nation, and he is going to give my people a land that is promised to them. When he comes to that land, the first thing that he does, he builds an altar. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. He built an altar to the Lord. From there, he went to the hills east of Bethel and he pinched a tent. Know this, we'll find out later if you read in Genesis that Abraham not only leaves everything that he had, probably leaving his home and the homes of those who were his servants in the homes of his family and his familiar territory, he would go to a place not given to him. It was promised to his ancestors. Abram would live his entire life as a nomad. He lived in tents. He would go from place to place to place and he never realized the promise of God in this life. Because Abraham, according to Hebrews, tells us he was looking for a land that was not built by human hands. He was looking for something far greater than this. And so as Abraham pushes off and goes off, he would do so at God's command and at God's promise that the people who would come after him, your offspring will inherit this land. Abraham never would see it. It would never be his land. He was like a foreigner. He was like an alien all the rest of his life. But what he had was a God who walked with him every step of the way. You see, we have that wonderful thing as well. Faith is what we long for in our life. At any one moment, you see, the heart is restless, the scripture says, or uh, Augustine said, there is a shaped vacuum within us. And that we long to have that filled with, with something. And we try and try and try to fill it with things, but only God will satisfy. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Abraham was declared righteous by his faith. God's grace, Abram's faith. And he was declared righteous by God because he placed his faith in what God had said. 
That is still the only way of salvation. It is God's grace to us that opens our eyes to our need. And then he grants us the ability to be able to receive what he is offering. Yesterday was the memorial service for Clarence Weaver. And we had some beautiful music. I heard, heard a number of people talk about how great the music was and how blessed they were to hear people from this congregation sharing in music and how talented that the people were in the church. And I shared a message yesterday, a message from John chapter 11, a message about Jesus and the loss of life of his friend Lazarus, in which Jesus declared to be the resurrection and the life. And as I shared that, I invited people, as Jesus invited people, to come to that knowledge. Come to the knowledge that he was the resurrection and the life. And I told the people, we have, more, uh, we have more evidence today than they had then because Jesus hadn't died upon the cross then. They didn't know about the resurrection in the way in which we know about the resurrection. They didn't know about the life that we can have the way it comes through the blood of Christ. And as I shared, I shared with them the invitation at the end that Jesus says to one of the sisters, do you believe this? And she says, I believe that you're the son of God who's coming into the world, the Messiah. I asked the people if they believed it, that a way of honoring the life of someone the greatest would be to find Jesus who was in that person. After lunch, or as we were eating lunch, I, I was seated at a table. There was only two spots left in the whole room. Two spots, and if I wanted to sit by my wife, I had to choose one of those. And I sat down at the table. There was a man there, in the name of Todd, and as we were finishing eating, he said to me, I, um, my mom passed away a couple of years ago and I had done her funeral. And he says, and since that time I have had this, this emptiness inside. And I haven't found anything that can, that can remedy it. And he said, do you think Jesus could? That is like uh, ears going up on a dog. <laughs> I talked to him just a second and I said, hey Todd, would you like to, like to go back and talk about that a second? He said, yeah. We went back to Pam Price's Sunday school room. Closed the door, talked a little bit. It was so evident that God was calling him to himself. He didn't have to do anything. If God calls us fishers of men, this one was already on the line. We got down on our knees as after I shared the gospel with him, of which I had shared with him before. But today was the day in which God was calling him to himself. And we got on our knees in the room, put our faces in chairs just like you're sitting on. And the best thing about being a pastor is hearing someone call upon the Lord. We came back out and um, I gave him a little material to be able to help him in his walk. Shared with him, you know, about a need to get involved in a local congregation. He lives in an area outside of, the, of this area. Told him I was gonna call him, get that checked out this week. Find him, a, find him a church where him and his wife and family can be a part of. We came back in and, and I said, uh, Todd, would you do me one more favor? Would you, would you talk to Cindy and Chrissy? Because I think they're going to be excited that on the day that their dad's funeral was is the day in which new life came to you. And they were. 
they were so excited. One, because they know Todd and have known Todd probably since he was a little bitty boy. And for some reason, today, yesterday, was God's appointed time for him to hear a message from him. And he could not turn away from it. And he didn't just believe that that chair would hold him. He went over and he sat in it. And the loving arms of a Savior wrapped around him and said, you are mine. Wow. That is a miracle. That can't be manufactured here upon this earth. I tell you what, I look forward to, uh, to finding a place for him to follow the Lord in baptism as we're going to baptize Josh in just a minute. And I look forward to the fact that maybe there's someone else here that maybe believes that the chair will hold you, but has never really sat down in it and found faith in Jesus Christ and allowed him to be the Lord of your life. Because when you do, you won't sit in the chair long because God doesn't sit still. God's got Abrahams all over the place who are going to Shechem and going to Bethel and going here and going there. I just met a brother this morning who was going to South Africa who is with us. Praise God. And we need to pray for Jonathan as he is going and going to be a missionary in, in uh, South Africa, him and his family carrying the same message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who has come to save us from our sins. And if we will turn from ourselves and trust in Him, evidenced by our action and our walk with Him, evidenced by our faith that is real, by a response to Him, we too will find salvation in Him.